Hello. Today's lecture is going to be on MEP noise and vibration control still. This is part three, our third lecture on this. In one of the last presentations on this subject, we discussed the three different types of transmission paths. There's the airborne, ductborne, and structureborne. I put the airborne in green here because you already know how to handle that. Say you have a noise source, it's going to radiate a certain sound power level. You know how to calculate how that's going to propagate through any kind of outdoor environment, how it's going to come in through an opening into a building or out of an opening out to some other space space outside um, or through a wall. Say you have a mechanical room with equipment in it and you're calculating what the sound pressure level is going to be on the other side. You know how to do all of that now. The duct borne is really what we're going to be focusing on now. We'll touch on the structure borne a little bit at the end. This is essentially vibration isolation and you take a vibrations class, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. But the, the duckborn is what we're really going to focus on here. So here's our title slide for that. And then there is an important statement here. That is, noise propagates with supply and against return equally. So you have your fan, you have the supply noise going, or the supply air going away from it. You go and supply the space it's serving. And then you have the return air coming back to the unit. They're traveling in different directions. Sound moves so much faster that it, it really doesn't make a difference if it's going downstream or upstream. We treat it in the same way. So let's just start with duct work. This is Duct-borne sounds, we'll just start out with a straight section of duct. So on this slide, we have, we're going to start with straight rectangular duct. So rectangular duct, it just has a height and a width of some dimension. And that type of duct attenuates low frequency noise. And this is whether it's acoustically lined or not. In the next bullet point down below, we'll look at this data in a little bit more detail, but this next bullet point down here says that straight round duct is not. So I guess here we can look at the data. Say we have um, a six inch by six inch duct, then we're going to get 0.3 decibels per linear foot at 63 hertz. And then if we went with round, so say it's something like a, a seven inch diameter duct or less. So the, the equivalent of this is probably gonna be somewhere between these two. But up here where we got 0.3 decibels per foot, here we're only getting 0 0.03. So it's, it's pretty insignificant down here. It is quite significant up here. Actually, this is gonna be about some of the best attenuation you're gonna get along the duct. Um, I guess maybe I shouldn't say that. Silencers will give you more and reflection loss will give you more, but this is going to be more than what you get unless you put really thick, let's say impractically thick lining inside of it. We're going to cover lining, but just imagine some fiberglass lining that absorbs sound. So the, the, the thing that's happening here is, if you imagine a, a round structure, it's just going to be a lot more rigid. That shape is just, it's not going to flop around like the rectangular spans. Um, the, so when the, the walls, when those rectangular sections kind of move more with, with the sound, they absorb it. That doesn't happen with the round, just because of the shape of it. So 
So something else we want to note here is that the attenuation decreases with increasing duct size. So as the ducts get bigger, there's a little bit of a something not quite following that right here at the very beginning. But as the, the ducts increase in size, in general, the attenuation will decrease. And then also as we increase frequency, the attenuation will decrease. So this is really a low frequency thing at 250 hertz and above. It's almost insignificant what we're getting in terms of absorption from this. Now on to the lining. So the like the line like the bullet point here says, adding lining significantly improves noise attenuation. So this primarily helps in the mid and high frequencies where the rectangular duct walls themselves provided the low frequency absorption. The, here the thicker lining, or here also thicker lining extends the attenuation to lower frequencies. So I guess first let's, first let's, Look at just this main point. So it's, it's a little bit hard to compare some of this because before our data was in decibels per linear foot. And I believe that up until this most recent publication, Mache, the, the 2019, I think in the, the 2015 and before, the ductwork with lining also was in decibels of attenuation per linear foot. But some more recent research has found that it's it's not exactly linear. So it, it's, you won't get, say if you go from five feet to 50 feet, you're not gonna get 10 times that, that same amount of absorption. So they they have, some intervals in here that you would want to interpolate between. I, I think they have another um, version of the book or some supplementary materials where you can get the more detailed data on this. Um, all my calculators, either I've made them off of the old linear foot and need to update them off of this, but I don't really use that very much anymore. Usually I use commercially available software now and I'll I'll show that to you but um let, let's see if we can make a little comparison here so the six by six and the 10 foot length duct let's just say that it is linear um, not linear and straight but linear in that if we reduce this down to one foot we get one tenth of this so that would give us 0.6 at 125 Hertz here at 125 hertz, we're only getting 0.2. So if we added one inch insulation for one inch duct liner, we would get three times as much attenuation per foot. And then this next bullet point primarily helps mid and high frequencies. Here if we see as we go to the mids and the highs, we get dramatically more attenuation. So here we're getting five decibels per foot. Again, if this is linear. Um, five decibels per linear foot and over here we're getting 0.1. So 0.1 versus five with adding one inch lining. So that, that's a huge difference. So you don't like here, it's not showing anything for 63 hertz. This is not like you add one inch insulation and you don't get this anymore. You still do. So you should include this along with this. It's just the predominant absorption in these frequencies comes from lining. Down here, it comes from just the duct. And then the next, this last bullet point, we're going to compare this table to this table. So thicker lining extends the attenuation to lower frequencies. So this table is one inch 
lining. This is two inch fiberglass lining. They're both fiberglass. So note at 1000 and 2000 hertz, it's still at 50. That doesn't change at all. If we go down to the 125, we get eight. And then at 250, we get 29 instead of six and 15 respectively. So that, that's pretty huge, going from 15 to 29, going from 27 to 49. The, the standard when ductwork is lined is one inch, but so unless it's a really tight design, meaning the, the ductwork is just too big for the space that's available, then an acoustical consultant could push to get two inch lining if necessary. That, that reminds me of one thing too that I didn't put in this slide, but say you do have ductwork that's, so you, you usually have a air handling unit on the roof and then say it's a multi-story building, you have a shaft, to bring it down multiple levels. And in that shaft, a lot of times they're gonna to want to try to make that, that shaft, that chase as small as possible, just to maximize the usable square footage of the space they're building. And sometimes it might be pretty tight to fit that duct work in there or to fit a change. Like if all of a sudden at the end of the design you say, I need two inches. Maybe it's not because you weren't paying attention for the first part of the design. It's just that you got brought on to it late. Um, whatever the reason, if, if you cannot, okay, sorry, I should say this in a different way. Um, there's this, so you might want to get the two inch insulation there. And there's a lot of times where you might have to sort of balance between two not perfect situations. And there, there's a rule for how much bigger that enclosure should be around your ductwork. Say if you had a, a 40 inch by 30 inch duct then you would want to make sure that you had a gap that was at least one-tenth of the duct dimensions from your duct. So um, in that case, from that, you, you'd want to have, ju just use the bigger one. Like I say, you'd want to have at least four-inch gap around your duct in any kind of wall surface so that your duct and that wall don't couple together. It's just a rule of thumb to use. This talk about not having enough space for ductwork reminded me of that and reminded me that I didn't put it into the into the slides, but that that is a good rule of thumb. Usually when you add the lining, you need to, you want to keep the same free, like open clear space inside. You don't want to increase the velocities of the airflow. So usually you need to have the space to expand the ductwork out on the outside. So this just shows that it's the same thing for round duct. Same bullet points. If we went through and compared all these things, we would see the, the increase at lower frequencies, if we go from one inch to two inch, you can see that primarily we're getting the absorption at the mids and the highs and not so much the lows. This slide is to talk about the different types of duct liners. The ASHRAE book only, all their data is for fiberglass and that's all that is mentioned in there. Um, but there are a couple other types that are gaining in popularity. Uh, again, we have some sort of competing features here, but let's just start with the acoustical data. So the, the three different types that we have are a closed cell. So here's a closed cell. It's like, a, you know, like a foam. Imagine like the spray foam that's closed cell. Um, 
Then we have fiberglass, which is fiberglass. It's the, the traditional duct liner, the one that all the ASHRAE data is for. And then we have polyester. Um, the, so let's go up and look at the data for each of these. The orange line is the fiberglass. And the gray line is the polyester. And the blue line is the closed cell. You can see up here, so, so the, well, let's first just compare the fiberglass and the closed cell. The, the polyester, I haven't seen that this much, or so I haven't seen that very much. The closed cell, that has been around for quite a while. It pops up a lot more. I imagine this polyester is probably gaining some ground. But um, to compare the fiberglass to the closed cell, there's was so roughly a 0.25. So the absorption coefficient of the fiberglass is roughly 0.25 greater. Let's say at least 0.2 greater for the entire spectrum. And if we get up here to these higher frequency bands, like we have 4K and 2K, the fiberglass is you know 75, 70% better, something like that. Uh, so fiberglass really kicks the butt of closed cell in terms of sound absorption. The polyester is pretty comparable in the mid frequencies. It's a little bit below in some areas, and it's actually a little bit above in others. But it is, la so all of these are one inch thin. It is significantly lacking at the lower frequencies and also very significantly lacking at the higher frequencies. So fiberglass wins. I have a couple other points here. So I already mentioned that ASHRAE data is for fiberglass. So if you want to use those tables, you have to have fiberglass insulation. Fiberglass is the best acoustically, as we just showed. But the, the advantage of the others and the reason why people kind of push for them or you know why you might have to convince a team against them in a acoustically critical application is that the others are better for air quality. So they're fiber free and they're antimicrobial. They're, so a lot of places where you know, here I see you kind of have these competing factors because good indoor air quality and good acoustics, those are both huge components of environmental, you know, say like lead design. So you kind of have these two competing things. In an ideal world, you can make it work with a closed cell. But um, I mean, I, I, it's just funny that this is the lecture today because this morning I was working on a project where they want the mechanical engineer there wants to use the the closed cell and I'm trying, I'm like, I'm showing him you can't in this case. It's, it's just, it's too, way too loud. You're, um, the calculation shows it's going to be 67 when it's supposed to be 40 for the, the NC level. And th that's just the first space. There's a bunch of other spaces that are like that too, but, um, maybe you just have to pick the one that's going to be the least offensive or try to come up with some radically different solution. But when you're at uh, the end of a design and a project's being built and it's, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot that you can do with radically different designs at that point. Uh, the last point, all of these provide thermal insulation as well. So you kind of get two birds with one stone there. A lot of times, if, if they're going to be putting a liner on the outside of a duct, you can say, well, let's just put it inside for noise attenuation. Now we're going to move on to elbows. We have three different types here. So these are all for rectangular duct. We have the square elbow, or mitered is what this would be called a lot of the time. And then radius elbow, and then we have an elbow with turning veins. And here you can see those turning veins kind of see the shape of them up here. So the main purpose of these is to try to keep the flow as laminar as possible. You, turbulent airflow is bad for all kinds of reasons. 
acoustically it produces noise so um, the turning vanes help to minimize the turbulence let's see so, so we have all this data here i think once we've introduced so this table corresponds to this, 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 to this. Let's go to the next slide. And okay, I guess before we go to, we have, we have another slide where we're going to compare, we're going to say a couple of points like we have with duct lining and with rectangular versus circular and stuff like that. But first I want to show you just what this FW and is. I mean, it's, it says right here, but just sort of a quick example. So F, we have a center frequency, and that's in kilohertz. So here we have our octave bands. So 63 hertz is the center frequency of this octave band. 125 hertz is the center frequency of this, of this octave band, and so on. Since that's in kilohertz, we want to divide this by 1,000. Right? That's in hertz, but we want it in kilohertz, so we divide them all by 1,000, and then we multiply them times the width. So here, you know, you're, this would be the width you'd use, not this dimension. But in this case, it's a square duct, so they're both 24. But if we take the 24 and multiply it times this divided by 1,000, we get 1 1.5, 3, 6, and so on. So now we just go up here. For the unlined, we pick the values here. The line, we pick the values here. And so, so this corresponds to this one. So we get zero for both of those. This is in here. We get one for both of those. This is six over here. We get five for the unlined and six for the lined. And so on. So, so we see that same... Um, my mind is blanking. What I'm, tr I'm trying to say, we're seeing that same trend where the lining being added absorbs mo more mid and high frequencies. So here the difference is 3 and 10. So quite a, quite a big difference for one elbow. El elbows are quite good for attenuating noise. They, like we mentioned with the uh, there's a need for elbows with turning veins. You know, you, on one hand, you could be producing turbulent noise. On the other hand, you could be attenuating it. The ideal would be to slow the duct, slow the airflow within the duct down so that you're getting this attenuation, but it's not causing turbulent airflow noise. And we're going to talk about some guidelines for doing that. But first, let's just compare... So this, this is from a program called AIM. I said for a lot of these calculations these days, I use a commercially available software package. Um, the name of that is AIM. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I'll show you it. But first, let's just take, so we have the data for a rectangular elbow miter that's, or mitered elbow, that's a rectangular duct that is 24 inch by 24 inch. It's the same thing as this, it's one inch lining. So that spit out this data, that spit out this data, they, they match. I, I know this program very closely follows all the ASHRAE stuff. It, let, let me show you it. I, kn I know that it follows all the ASHRAE stuff. I mean, one, if you, there's probably some place where you can read and find that, but I used to work with the guy that created this program. He ended up selling it to Potorf. And it's theirs now. And you, you can actually get this for free. Um, just go to the Potterf website if you want it. It's um, you, I think you put in an email and they send you a license for it. It's it's a great program. The, so Potterf, they make other things. But the main thing that they make that is the purpose of all this and why they offer it for, for free are duck silencers. So it's populated with all of the silencers from Potter. And it, it's very convenient. It has, has a, like, you, let me just show you. We, let's add a space. So we add a space, we can say conference room. And then 
we can come here and we can just bring in the criteria right from, this is the same stuff that's in that ASHRAE table that we discussed. So we bring that in, it has the 30 NC or RC criteria. So right, right here, it's gonna, whatever we create for noise data, it's going to plot it over here. It's gonna take away all the attenuations from all the duct stuff that we put in. And we're gonna see if we meet this NC30 or not. Now let's add a path. First, let's just say we're gonna do the supply path and this will be AHU, air handling unit one. You can create libraries. So let's see what I have in here. So um, let's say, so these are packaged RTUs. Some, I think it's incorrect, but some people sometimes call these air handling units. In any case, let's just grab one. It doesn't really matter. We're going to have discharge inlet and radiated. radiated. Just the, the radiated in particular is going to be quite a bit greater um, for a packaged unit, unless it has a really good casing than the air handling unit. But we we discussed all that. That's this. So here we have from carrier. It's a six ton unit. Let's put this in. I put that in for my global library. And then you can just start going through and adding in all of the ductwork. So say it's on the roof, we end up dropping it like five feet through the roof. It, there's an 18 inch curb and then it drops down a few more feet below to get past all the structure. So it's, let's say it's 24 wide by 48 and it's lined with one inch. So here it's, it's calculating the attenuation of that. And then say we come down to the bottom and um, just have an elbow. And here, we, when you're just dropping down right below a unit like that, it's often mitered um, with turning veins. So it's flowing fast there. Actually, I, I probably should have made it even bigger ductwork because we're at, oh, oh no, I'm sorry. We're at 375 feet per minute. So th this is, Perfectly fine. It's actually pretty slow. More at this point in the duct work, you'd expect something more like um, 1,200. So I, I put in probably too big of duct here for a six-ton unit. So let's take this down. I probably should even reduce it more than that. We're still only at 600 feet per minute. Like I said, normally that would be something more like uh, 1,200 at this point. But you, you can keep going on. And the more stuff that we add in, the more it's going to bring this down. I, I don't want to let, you know say bad things about one company or what one pr person produced versus another. I, you know, I think this program has lots of good points to it. The other like main competitor, and I don't, Know that it's really even a competitor because I mean this one's free, but um, Train produces one that people use for many years. The last it's been many years since I've used that one because when the guy I was working with developed this one, as I was working with him, I switched over to start using this, and that was before Potsworth bought it. But um. The train one back then cost $700. And if, so, so here I need to go through this and say I want to instead calculate for the, a, a different space, but it's still fed by the same branch. I need to copy all of this. So I need to copy, I need to create another room with different criteria and then whatever changes are different from the supply path. I, I need to make those changes in that path. You know, like say here, I just copy, paste, and save. You can link them together, and th that does make it easier. But um, it also kind of makes it it makes troubles. I, I usually don't link them because um, the the changes I want to make later. It, I just, maybe it's not even the, the best. It's just my habit has been to not link them. You, you kind of win 
with some and you kind of lose with others. But in any case, there, you end up having to have these paths that are copies of each other. And these links um, are how you kind of make it more efficient to, like, say you need to go back and make a change that's going to affect all of these. You could do that with this. But say you want to add in something new. That's not going to show up over here. I think that's why I don't like the, the linking so much. Well, I just do each one because if, if I go and make a change, I go and make it in all the others. And that might seem like a really cumbersome thing. And somebody might think of that as a major fault of this program. Like if you compared it to tap, if you make a change upstream, it affects all downstream paths. But the, the thing that I, I, I that like must be understood about this, like I, when I was saying that about plots or about aim, I don't I, I don't think it's a bad thing because the original t intent of this program was that it functioned as a plugin in Revit, and it was just supposed to automatically calculate if a mechanical engineer came along and designed their mechanical system using BIM, building information modeling, but like the whole point of Revit, and they did it all as they were supposed to, then you could just run this plugin within Revit and you know, all the, the calculations would essentially just be automated. And you wouldn't care about these different paths. Like these, these different paths, it works with that paradigm. But Andrew, the guy that invented this or, or developed this, he, uh, it, it wasn't just him, but I mean, the thing that was discovered was that mechanical engineers are not using Revit or BIM as they're supposed to. Like, you know, at this point, maybe they're starting to get caught up, but essentially for many years, mechanical engineers were just using BIM as, or using Revit as a, like a 3D modeling. They, they they weren't using all the potential of BIM. So um, the original intention of this program didn't really, it was ahead of its time. It's still ahead of its time. And it, it basically got canned into like some, you know, just somebody sits down and runs the calculations type of thing. I, I, I think it was quite a genius development and hopefully one day the field of mechanical engineers doing building system design will catch up to it. But anyways, that's enough about that. I hope I didn't offend TAP or, pot or AIM or anybody in any way in any of that. I, I have tremendous respect for all of them. They all are very useful. Let's see, uh, where are we? We're going to get back into the ductwork elbows. So here, I, so here we're saying attenuation increases with, and I say increases, I underline it because we had one of these on the previous slide where it was decreases. So we're kind of getting opposite things here. So here the attenuation increases with increasing duct size. So as we go to bigger ducts, we get more attenuation. And then increasing frequency also, as we increase frequency, we get increased attenuation. And then the lining, so from here to here, we, we get increased attenuation. Then here are the circular versions of that. It, it's similar stuff. I, I have, so I, Put a bunch of these different ones into AIM so that we could compare them all. This is that rectangle, rectangular elbow miter that we looked at. Um, if just compare, maybe the, the better thing is to start with the circular ones here. That's what this main page is about. So we have circular. So we're going from unlined to lined. We see a significant increase in absorption, primarily in the mids and the highs, not anything down here in the lows. If we increase the size of it, we also see an increase. Um, we see the increase in frequency that we talked about. And then from the radius to the miter, we see an increase, just like we did 
with the, maybe we didn't point that out, but it's the same thing with rectangular. You go from the radius to the mitered, you're going to get a, a lot more attenuation up here, the mitered. And I think all this is what we talked about on the, the previous page. Maybe rectangular elbow miter, 24 by 24, that's probably pretty similar to, I guess this is maybe a little bit bigger. We have lined and lined, but so negative one, negative six versus negative 11, negative 11. So these are pretty similar up here. They're getting a little bit more out of the circular elbow miter than the rectangular elbow miter at. That would be 250 hertz, but still um, most octave bands are pretty close there. Moving on to some completely different phenomena, kind of mention, or you learned the concept behind this, but now it's being applied to HVAC ductwork. So the, the what this is referred to as is the end reflection loss. And this comes back to the impedance change. Remember, we, we talked a lot about impedance changing transformers, mismatches, how we use those, how we overcome them, et cetera, et cetera. But the main point um, is that if you get a big change in an in acoustical impedance, then you're going to reflect the sound back. Like that's the principle that ultrasound works on. We gave a bunch of other examples. But that's what's happening here. You have this duct. So the bigger the transition, so like going from a small duct just into a wide open room is going to result in a huge attenuation. It really reflects that low frequency back. You're going from um, really high impedance to really low impedance of the, you know, from this compressed duct work to a big open room. So, um... I guess let's talk about these bullet points. So we mentioned that reflects low frequency sound, mentioned that and it, it's a huge low frequency noise reduction. So if you have a six inch duct diameter and say a lot of times you bring a supply duct and you might start out with like a, who knows, you might start out with like a seven foot by 10 foot duct. That happens. And it might go and it might split off to all kinds of different spaces and you might eventually get down to just one diffuser with a six inch diameter neck on it. So th this is gonna be a huge attenuation there at the end. It's really beneficial. Um, so a couple things, this is only for, only for these dimensions for a duct that's terminated flush with the wall. If you had some other dimensions, and I should also say this is, so this is for circular duct. We have a diameter here, right? So if you want other dimensions, or if you wanted to calculate for rectangular, then you could use this equation. So this, um, so, so cross-sectional area is going to give you the, Say you had you know a 12 inch by 12 inch duct, you'd get the cross-sectional area of that, that would be your area, that'd be this A, then multiply that times four divided by pi, you would get the um the effective duct diameter. So that is how you can get the rectangular from this table. But the part about how you get the end reflection loss for any dimensions for dimensions beyond what's just in this table, and also you might have a duct that doesn't just terminate flush in a wall. It might be, you know, you might have the open ceiling thing that's incredibly popular these days. So you just look up and you see the duct work. It's hanging there in the free space. It, you get a different end reflection loss for that. So to get any values that's not in this table or to get it for the free space, you want to use this equation. And so the A1 and the A2, they just come from this table. So you have one A1 and one A2 for flush, one A1 and one A2 for a free space. 
then the C is the speed of sound. And you want to be dimensionally consistent with D. So D is that diameter from that's this equation here. And everything here is in feet because I, I remember I gave you the ASHRAE both in the inch pound and in the, the metric SI. So um, I, I most the work that you're doing here is going to be in um, imperial inch pound units. The if you're working internationally, of course, it's going to be an SI, but that's why I went with the uh, imperial. So pretty much everything here is in imperial or inch pound. In that case, you'd want to use 1,125 feet per second for that. And then the frequency. So, so this is frequency dependent. That's the F. And this is in hertz. It's not in kilohertz like that last equation we looked at. And then, uh, well, I guess we already mentioned the D. So pretty easy equation. We can get this table. We can get anything in between. We can get it for rectangular. We can get it for flush. We can get it for free space. A lot of things we can get from that simple equation. OK, now I want to talk about a different type of duct work. This is lined flexible duct. A lot of, if, if you've ever gone up in the attic of your house, you probably see this. This is hugely popular in residential. In commercial designs, it's not used nearly to the extent that it is in residential. So usually, commercial designs, you'll see hard duct throughout most of the building. And then they'll just use this flexible duct right at the very end. It kind of helps to, you know, like when the HVAC contractor comes in, he doesn't know exactly where all the, the acoustical ceiling tile of the ceiling is going to end up. So he puts that ductwork in to the best of his ability, you know, according to what the drawings say. And, you know, there might not have been perfect coordination, so maybe there's some structure exactly where it should have been, or somebody else put their stuff there. They might need to put it off to the side. So for whatever reason, there's not a perfect alignment between the diffuser and the ductwork. That diffuser that's going to go in the ceiling and the ductwork that was installed sometime before that. So this flexible duct allows that offset. There's a dark negative side to that that we're going to get to. But right now, I'm just kind of demonstrating the or telling you the, the good point, the purpose of this. So that's lined flexible duct. It's also known as acoustical or flex duct. A big thing about this is that it negates end reflection loss. So those huge losses that we, you know, we saw with six inch round in a flush with the wall application, we're getting 18 decibels of attenuation. This just completely negates that. If so, my best understanding of why this happens is just that this flex duct kind of blurs the transition. You don't have that hard transition from you know contained within a small duct to all of a sudden in the big room. This just kind of blurs the line between the two. Maybe it sort of acts like a transformer in a way. So I, I have this in red, and I have a sub bullet point there that this is not well known. And I was fortunate enough where my first boss, like I don't even remember, it's 16, 17 years ago now, something like that. She knew this, and she told me, you know, don't do this. Don't, don't, if you have duct work and it has flex duct right before the diffuser, you can't include the attenuation both for the flex duct and the end reflection loss. You have to have the hard duct to be able to get that end reflection loss. And she's, you know, she told me ASHRAE doesn't, doesn't mention this, but, you know, from her own measurements or from her bosses or whatever, she like knew that that was the case. And I, 
So I went forward with that. And it wasn't until Ashray, so, so like, the, the, you know, you're looking at the 2019 version. It wasn't until the version before that. So it wasn't until 2015 that they actually published that. A little while before that, you could find a publication from, I think, Georgia Tech that um, measured that in a bunch of cases and, and proved that, it, I mean, she was right. You you don't get both at the same time. But it, it wasn't until twenty the 2015 version of ASHRAE that they, that they had that in there. I won't mention their names, but I had other coworkers after I left that company that I kept telling them, like, you can't do this, you can't do this. It, they never believed me, but eventually it's like, look, now Ashray even says it, and they didn't have any argument anymore, but you don't, don't want to do that. Still, I, people still do that. People still think you can get in reflection loss and um, flex duct. And even a lot of the, the manufacturers will, will account for both in their calculations. Like if, uh, so there's variable air volume boxes. It's like part of their control system, essentially. It, it's like an automatic damper that opens and closes to regulate how much air is flowing out to a, a particular part of the system. They, they would publish their sound power data that you'd have to dig for a little bit more, but they would also just publish NC values. And their NC values for the longest time included both in reflection loss and flex duct attenuations. I think some of them are moving away from that now, now that Ashray's published it, but it was a long time you had to really be careful with those NC ratings that manufacturers would publish because they would be accounting for both. Anyways, the an, another bad, or I guess I shouldn't say bad, it has a bad side and a good side. But another characteristic of line flex duct is that it has very low breakout transmission loss. So like we're going to study breakout transmission loss here soon. It's in the upcoming slides. But basically, it's a measure of how much the duct prevents the sound from breaking out from the duct, getting out into the environment around. So as you can imagine, you know, some duct usually goes from you might have the, the really heaviest stuff being 16 gauge. That's fairly uncommon, but sometimes it's there. You might get up, you know, 22, 24 sometimes as in on the, the lighter end of the ductwork. But in any case, that, you know, sheet metal is going to be a much more dense. And by what we learned about transmission loss, if you remember the mass law, that's going to provide a lot more transmission loss than just an inch of fiberglass with some plastic and foil over it. So, so this really doesn't stop. If there's noise traveling through it, once it gets to this point, it's just going to break out. Um, part, part of probably the reason why this, but, you know, the, the blurring of the line between the, the, the two different impedance segments. But I said this has a good side and a bad side. It's bad if it breaks out to a noise sensitive space. So say you have this right up above a like a fiberglass acoustical ceiling tile, something else that also doesn't provide much transmission loss. Then the, the breakout and the loss of the end reflection loss can be really bad. But say you had this above uh, gypsum board ceiling, or, or just it's breaking out into a non-noise sensitive space. It's in some gypsum board soffit or something like that. In that case, then that breakout could be good. We're almost to the 50 minute limit that is our normal time. I, so here we have the insertion loss of various lengths of various diameter flex ducts. So there's all, all these tables, I'm just taking the top part, they extend quite a bit lower. So you'll have to refer to the ASHRAE handbook to get all the data you need. But I did want to mention this. This is a way that you can have the flex duct and improve the, the breakout transmission loss. So the, so the FlexMaster and ITL 
I'm not one to advertise for them, but this is the, the, the standard one that gets used, as, at least as far as I'm aware of. haven't really seen much else that gets used besides this one, but it's, it's a triple lock standard aluminum duct. So it's a, it's a metal duct, but it's flexible. And you can put this inside of this, and you can improve, you can still get the flexibility, and you can improve that, that breakout transmission loss. And I'm usually more concerned about the break-in transmission loss with these. Like, say you have a roof with a, a loud noise, a really noisy unit over it, and you have a conference room below that. Like the number one rule is like real estate is location, location, location. Like you don't want to do that. You don't want to put the really loud rooftop unit over the most sensitive space in the building. But it, it happens all the time, unfortunately. That rooftop unit should be put over the bathrooms. It should be put over storage spaces. You know, something less sensitive. But say you put it over a sensitive space so somebody says, okay, well, we're, you, know, the, you, the acoustical consultant, says we need to have a sound isolation ceiling. We want to have a couple layers of gypsum board with a bunch of insulation on the back side of it. We want to hang it on hangers so it's resiliently isolated. They, they do all this to, to make a good sound isolation between that unit up on the roof and the space below. But then they'll come and they'll have ductwork that comes in like this with just its flex duct at the end. So that noise that comes down through the lightweight roof breaks into this and then it goes through the diffuser into the room. And you just short-circuited all of that big sound isolation ceiling. So if you put this over it, you can stop the break in before it feeds or before it gets into the conference space. So I've gone a couple minutes over what our normal 50 minutes are. Um, well, I, I still have some more stuff to show you, but I'll, I'll do that for our, our last lecture.